Eagles Entertainment. With the 10th pick in the 2021 NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select... You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and it is finally here. Our first preview of the 2021 season, the 2022 NFL Draft. And we're going to start today with all of the top prospects outside of the Power Five. And you might think, oh, well, there aren't that many great players outside the Power Five, right? Well, two of the top three picks from this past draft would have fit into this with Zach Wilson from BYU and obviously Trey Lance, the quarterback from North Dakota State, because we are pulling players from the all of the independents. So all the independent schools, that's Notre Dame, BYU, Liberty, UConn, UMass, Army, and New Mexico State, all of the group of five schools. So the America, the AAC, the Mountain West, the Sun Belt, Conference USA, the MAC. All right. So some great players from those conferences have come out and had success. And then obviously you get into FCS, D2, D3 as well. And we're going to hit on some players from all these levels of competition. And we're going to do that today, not just with Ben Fennel, but with my friend Emery Hunt, who you can follow on Twitter just like I do at F ball game plan, football game plan on Twitter. Emery does an outstanding job. Uh, He does. uh, He is one of the, I told him this uh, in the past. He is one of the all time hustlers uh, in this business. He does. He does color commentary for a number of colleges. He works over at CBS sports HQ. You can go follow him on Twitter. Like I said, at F ball game plan. He's over on the college draft podcast with our buddy, Ross Tucker, uh, a show that you may have heard me on uh, in the past. And then um, again, just out does outstanding work over on his YouTube page. So Emery's going to join us. Ben's going to join us. We're going to talk through all the top prospects outside of the power five conferences. We're going to do all that in draft buzz before we get there. Quick reminder, if you like what you hear here on the podcast, because right now we're starting to kick into high gear, go on to Apple Podcasts, go on to Stitcher, wherever you listen, leave us a rating, leave us a comment, leave us a review, leave us a question. If you've got a player that you want to hear hear an in-depth scouting report on, if you've got a school that you want to give us a heads up on, some players that we need to watch, now is the time. Jump on, leave us the question, leave us the review. Not only do we help you, but you help us by leaving that comment, by leaving that rating. Appreciate everybody that has done that in the past. I'm going to ask you for your help again, and I'm going to do it every single episode. Go on, wherever you listen, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. That said, let's get this show rolling. We've got a lot of prospects to cover. We're going to do it right now in Draft Buzz. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. All right, well, as I mentioned earlier, excited to jump into our first preview of the 2021 college football season. Joining me, Ben Fennell. And Emery Hunt. Emery, welcome back to the show, man. Glad to be here with, with two guys that represent Eagles fans and Eagles Nation the best. Well, I appreciate it, man. It's, it's always fun uh, to start digging into a new crop of players. And all three of us, uh, to different extents, have started to watch these guys. But I'm going to go category by category here and just kind of break down some of these top players, players that uh, fans should know as we get ready for the college football season. And we'll start with this. And this is obviously a huge huge pull of players that we were pulling from because we were doing non power five schools. So I hit on that a little bit earlier, giant pool of players for us all to pick from. And we're going to start things off uh, with the top prospect out of this entire group. Uh, Emery, I'll come to you first Uh, in your mind. Who is the top prospect from all of these schools outside of the power five? Because of how much importance is on the quarterback position, um, I'm going to go that way, and I'm going to say Malik Willis. When you talk about prospect, you're talking about tools and then potential. So you look at someone that runs a 4-4 that has a legitimate Tech Mobile arm that can go end zone to end zone and was able to lead a Liberty team to a very impressive season. I joked all throughout the year that they were co-ACC champs. You know, had they beaten yeah. NC State, which they nearly did, um, you know, defense fell late. They just couldn't convert they would have gone 3-0 and versus the ACC. And not just, you know, Duke and playing Duke again and then playing Duke some more. No, they were they beat Virginia Tech. Uh, they were going to take out um, NC State. So they were really competitive in the ACC. And so you combine all of that with the upside potential. That was his first year starting at quarterback. But what we expect to be a, a fantastic, you know, season this year. So you combine all of those traits and what we saw last season, to me, from a prospect perspective, um, because the quarterback is so important, Malik Willis to me is the best overall prospect. And Ben, I know you studied Malik Willis. The thing that stands out to me about him, I mean, under six foot one, 215 pounds, he's undersized. 
but he plays a lot bigger, a lot stronger than that. A really tough kid, takes a lot of contact. We talked about this with Trey Lance last year as well, That uh, and Trey Lance, a much bigger package. You know, he's in that 6'4", 220 range. Malik Willis, considerably smaller, but you see him like lo- dropping the shoulder on defenders out in the open field. You see him playing through contact, shaking out uh, that Houdini element to his game. Uh, makes him a, a really fun player to watch. Well, anytime I think you have the high-end combo of traits of having a really strong arm and being a, an elusive, dynamic athlete and a very poised athlete, which is a term that Dane Brugler used in his breakdown, which I really liked because it's like the game slowed down for him. He's never frenetic. He's never panicking. Seems to be always under control and able to use that athleticism in a very calm manner in combination with being a thick lower half athlete, a strong arm. It's a lot of tools to like. Yeah, the only element I'd like to see him improve, just too many throws late in the middle of the field last year that I'd like to see him kind of take some of those, either make that throw a little bit earlier, don't make it at all, just from a decision-making aspect. Well, that's that uh, double-edged sword because that yeah. strong arm sometimes gets it in there with that late read, a little bit of that Donovan McNabb uh, type of trend. Uh, the arm arrogance, which, uh, I, which is a term <laughs> I love, but he he certainly has it. And he is, I mean, some of the best throws in all of college football last year uh, came from the right hand of Malik Willis, one of my favorite players uh, that I've studied so far. Uh, I'll go next year, and I'm going to go with the guy that comes from uh, the FBS level, and that is Kyle Hamilton, an independent Notre Dame. They played in the ACC last year. They were not on Liberty's schedule. Uh, but you look at Notre Dame, you look at Kyle Hamilton, six foot four, a hair under 220 pounds, rare size for the position, extremely long arms, and an explosive athlete. He eats up grass, he closes in a flash, and he has got true command of his speed running the alley. He can gear up, he can gear down. He knows how to pace himself when he's approaching the line of scrimmage. And, you know, he had a bunch of missed tackles as a freshman when he was kind of a backup and role player, but he, those misses really kind of came when he didn't break down uh, in time where he came in a little bit too hot and was out, you know, wasn't able to come to balance and finish one-on-one still had a handful of those last year as a sophomore, but much better in terms of coming down with temp- good temperament, good pace, and able to finish one-on-one. If he gets a hand on you as a tackler, you're done. I'm a very powerful striker, really violent finisher, good blitzer from a variety of angles uh, in that defense. It will be a new scheme. Clark Lee moving on to be the head coach uh, down at Vanderbilt. So a new scheme up there in South Bend, but uh, watching him play in that system, really, really, Really fun. I would say in coverage, um, really, a, a really a, kind of one of those enforcers over the middle of the field. He's attacks crossing routes, uh, good zone awareness. He had a couple plays um, on the backside against like quick game route concepts where he, he was able to break on throws quickly and uh, make some plays in coverage. He's just, I think that what in the draft community will get stuck, I think, trying to make the comparison Kyle Pitts. To weird, weirdly, Kyle Pitts to Kyle Hamilton, where you know Kyle Pitts comes out, he's the top five pick as the the Swiss Army knife, do it all tight end last year, and I feel like we're going to say, hey, like Kyle Hamilton, he's the answer, he's college football's answer to Kyle Pitts. I just don't know that he's that player right now in terms of being that tight end eraser. I don't like him as much in man coverage. I think the man instincts not quite there yet. He's a little bit grabby mid route. I like him much more uh, as a zone scheme player, rally to the football, be violent, attack the line of scrimmage. He's really, really productive over the, the course of the last two seasons. Uh, I really, I think this guy's going to be a dynamite starter in the NFL. You just got to keep the role in mind. But uh, I love Kyle Hamilton. I, I'm not sure, Emery, how much work have you done uh, on this kid? I, I really, really like this film. Just, just in the passing view, and what I like most about him is his uh, explosiveness is fluid. So a lot of times out of 10, you see guys that are trying to come and lay a big hit, but they're just, it's, it's, a, it's a stiff type of, stop, load up, and, and deliver a blow. For him, it's more like Keanu Neal. You yeah. know, he's explosive, he's fast, and it's a fluid one-motion bomb getting you on the ground. So um, I, I like him as a, as a player. I can't wait to dive into him more as, you know, the season goes on. Ben, I know you want to stay in the secondary. I'll let you transition to your player. And if you've got any thoughts on Kyle Hamilton, go ahead there as well. Yeah, Hamilton's really interesting, more of a back-end fluid ball hawk rather than that thumper or killer over the middle. But he's still ascending and developing his body. He's added about 20, 25 pounds since high school. So still figuring out the type of player and the presence with that body and the weight. I think still he's growing and still developing. It could be one of the few generational type players in this next upcoming draft class, which everybody wants to know. Who is that guy that's the game changer? Who's that guy with that Hall of Fame type of pedigree? It might be Kyle Hamilton and not a whole lot of other prospects in this draft class. But Mm -hmm. I think we hit this right on the head when you're talking about non-Power 5. Who's the most likely to be drafted the highest? That's Malik Willis. That's Kyle Hamilton. And I think the third to join that party is Cincinnati corner Ahmad Gardner 
who has been an absolute stud press corner and Luke Fickle's defense over at Cincinnati for the last two years. He's tall. He's long. He's got the ball skills. He's got that feisty, pesky, physical personality that seems to come with guys from Detroit. I know there's certain pockets of the country where you just get a certain presence of player, certain presence of personality and attitude in Detroit players just bring that little bit of chip and swagger on their shoulder. And Ahmad Gardner has brought that from day one to Cincinnati with his six interceptions, about 15 PBUs in the past two years with some game-changing plays. I'm talking about fourth quarter pick sixes that really turn the tide. Reminds me a lot of a Dominique Rogers cromartie style of cover player but with a more physical personality and just a better overall football player. So a guy that's entering his true junior year coming up in 2021, but has already put together two really good quality seasons at Cincinnati and a lot of press man for Luke Fickle's defense. So it's easy to see the translatable skills uh, to an NFL defense. DRC was a guy that fit this category right out of Tennessee state was a top 10 pick uh, when he came out of the draft over a decade ago. Uh, Emery, not sure. Have you done any Ahmad Gardner? yet if so uh, what have you seen well I've seen a lot of Ahmad Gardner uh, in that secondary as well just by studying those prospects they had last year at Forrest um, and, and the other kid that was a linebacker that I transitioned to mm. safety um, so they have a ton of talent Byron uh, Brian Cook is another one who I saw a lot of at, at Howard before he transferred back home uh, to Cincinnati and so that gives him another prospect but Gardner I think also when you look at his body type he can add a couple of more pounds um, too, like, and not lose that athleticism. And I like the DRC comp because DRC is someone that we saw go through the motions outside corner, inside corner, became a safety. Um, you know, by the end of his career, I could see all of those things happening for a gardener who has that same type of makeup. All right, well, let's stay with the Bearcats here. We're going to transition to our next category top senior on offense. So, real, real self explanatory who is the top senior on offense for this class, uh, outside the power five? Emery, uh, you want to go with Cincinnati quarterback Desmond Ritter? Yeah, and I think when you look at senior, I didn't, I'm not sure what, you know, with the year that we just came off of 2020, yeah. uh, you know, somebody could be a freshman, somebody could be a, a seventh-year senior. <laughs> Who knows, right? None of the websites update. So uh, all I know is uh, Ritter is a senior. So I, I chose Ritter here. Um, he's someone that when you're looking at prospects in the summer, you kind of want to start senior and then work your way down, take yep. care of those, those guys that you know are going to graduate. And, again, he had a lot of momentum going into last year, wanted to come back and try to get Cincinnati into the playoffs. So you like that type of uh, leadership and that type of mentality. And also he knows he has to work on this game. And he's someone I think that has gotten better every year. And there's some parts of his game where you watch him and you think, man, won't you be a little bit more decisive there or just something about it that's just not there just yet. And so you hope that gets erased this season as he comes back for his final year. I would agree. I, I feel like there's still some meat left on the bone uh, with him as a prospect. And, and he's played a ton of football uh, for the for the NFL teams that still kind of follow. And there are, are a bunch of them that still follow the Bill Parcells criteria of what they're looking for at quarterback. Uh, I mean, the guy's 30 and five as a starter. If you if you buy into, uh, you know, the winning records, the QB win stats and things like that, uh, you know, he's going to be a very experienced player coming out. I just want to see him kind of get a little bit better in some of those key areas. Uh, ben, I know you've done Desmond Ritter as well. Yeah, he's a really interesting player. I love his mobility. I think he needs to refine himself as a passer just a little bit. But just to kind of yep. sum it up, if Jordan Love can go in the first round, yep. so can Desmond Ritter. And I think they're similar style of players with similar trajectories, both relying on the mobility athleticism a little bit more than just being a pure pocket passer. But you love the tools. And I think a team may see Ritter as a project player that could be a starter in a year or two. All right, so let's talk about some pass catchers here, and I'll go next uh, with South Alabama wide receiver Jalen Tolbert, six foot three, 195 pounds. This kid looks like a, a basketball player, and he plays like it. He's a really springy athlete. He's twitched up. He's explosive. He's got speed to stretch the field and made plays at all three levels. And he's not just build up speed either, because uh, you know he's got some giddy up early. He could separate early, but then also he's got that speed to pull away late as well. And he's just awesome at the catch point. Uh, he could track the ball over the shoulder, made some really acrobatic catches uh, going down to the ground. He could pluck the ball off the defender's helmet, did it multiple times on film uh, watching him. 
He's just got to clean up everything before that phase of the route, before the catch point, everything before that. I just like to see him get a little bit more consistent. His releases, especially against press coverage, have to get a little bit, a little bit better, um, inconsistent as a route runner. He's got the tools. He can sink his hips and get in and out. He, he's got a nice little dead leg to create some separation mid route as well. You just don't see it consistently enough. So uh, I think I'd like to see those would be the areas I'd like to see him get better. Um, he can go up and get it. Kind of reminds me from a skill set standpoint. You think of like tall, linear, athlete, you know, springy athlete, like a, a Robbie Anderson, a Marquez Valdez Scantling, maybe even like a Gabe Davis, maybe even a little bit more juice than a Gabe Davis. I think kind of in that mold, I think Tolbert uh, can be an NFL starter. Uh, he's a guy I, I'm high on. I really liked watching his tape. Uh, ben, I know you wanted to do another receiver as well. Well, there's a bunch of really interesting receivers in this category, whether it's the productive Justin Hall at Ball State, who's kind of a uh, chain mover slot receiver, whether it's Calvin Turner at Hawaii, who's essentially former quarterback corner, now playing slot, running back, wing tight end. Reggie Roberson, SMU, is kind of a vertical deep threat. He came back for a, another season. But Romeo Dubs out at Nevada seemed to be the go-to darling of Carson Strong in 2020, had over 1,000 yards, 11 touchdowns. But if you look at his production the last two years, all of college football guys, 100 catches, so you got to be productive. With a 16.0 average per catch, so you got to be explosive and vertical. It's only five players that have done that. Devontae Smith, Tylen Wallace, Deami Brown, Tutu Atwell, and Romeo Dubs. It's pretty wow. good company right there. The four of those guys all went high in the draft last year, some higher than others, like our own Devontae Smith here in yep. Philadelphia. But Romeo Dubs is 6'2", 200, great vertical speed, instant acceleration rolling off the line of scrimmage. But his vertical stems are very, very strong. He knows how to track the ball well, can hold that red line to give a nice window for the ball to drop into out on the sidelines. Reminds me a little bit of like a Jacoby Jones. Kind of a long strider guy, not, doesn't get a whole lot of action underneath, not really a possession receiver, not really a screen receiver, a guy you want to throw shot plays to. He's tall, he's long, he's an explosive guy, a lot of traits to like in Romeo Dubs, and there's going to be a lot of attention on this Nevada offense this year. Carson Strong is going to be the darling. Who's catching passes? Romeo Dubs is going to be doing that. And not to mention one of the best names in college football as well. I mean, Romeo no Dubs. Question. Like, I mean, it's, <laughs> I, no question. One of the best names in the, in the nation. Uh, Emery, any thoughts on, on Dubs or on Jalen Tolbert? Tolbert plays in a, the Power 7 Sunbelt Conference, so I'm all in on Tolbert. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, he sounds like a more explosive version of Jonathan Adams. Mm. Uh, you know, yep. Adams was was talented, and, and I was shocked he was an early release from Detroit, but Tolbert is more athletic, more dynamic in that yeah. regard, does a lot of the same things. And, and Dubs, to me, tracks the ball extremely well. I watched a lot of Nevada last year um, with, with their the run they were making last season in the Mountain West. You know, Toa Tower, good running back. Uh, they got a good offensive line. And, you know, talk about shot plays. That that, that was what saved them versus San Diego State mm. was, was Dubs going deep down the field, down the sideline. So he does track and stack rather well. So I'm a big fan of both of those receivers. Uh, we're not done talking about that Nevada offense for sure. Uh, let's go to – we'll stay on offense. We'll talk about intriguing underclassmen on that side of the ball. So the top draft eligible underclassmen on offense. Emery, uh, I'll come back to you for this one. Uh, Jaron Hall, quarterback BYU. You know, Love he it. was the starter – before, you know, Zach Wilson um, was the starter. Because both guys, it's something about that position or whatever out there at, U, at BYU, but these guys all get injured. Like, they constantly <laughs> get injured. New guy comes in, plays well, then he gets injured. Backup is really good. He gets injured. Third guy is good, too. So um, they know how to recruit quarterbacks, but Jaron Hall has a lot of the same traits as what you saw Zach Wilson. Athletic, can throw on a move. He has a stronger arm. It's probably not as a fluid uh, he's not as fluid as of an athlete or a thrower as Wilson, but can definitely push the ball deep downfield consistently. And I think that's an area where Wilson wasn't as good. A lot of those balls that he was throwing deep down the field tend to die in the mm -hmm. air, so it became 50-50 balls. But he's hitting these guys in stride to where they're accelerating to his passes down the field. Can he stay healthy? And if and that's a big can because he has those concussion issues, and we know how serious that mm -hmm. is. So if he's able to stay concussion-free and health-free, He'll put up similar numbers uh, in that offense and also will give them more of a projection as a, uh, a dual threat type of guy, more so than Zach Wilson was. But it's all about help for, for Hall. But he's in a right uh, assist to really break out this year. 
this might sound like a shtick for me, but he will, I think he will be a 24 year old redshirt junior. He came out in the 2016 class, I believe in high school, took a two year mission. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, he was, he was the starter before Zach Wilson, who just got drafted, but he's still an underclassman, uh, by eligibility. That's BYU for you. That's BYU. <laughs> exactly right. So, uh, all right. So let's get to the next one here, Ben. Uh, you got a player that, uh, that really caught my eye last year and Ulysses Bentley, the running back from SMU. Oh, this kid's a lot of fun. He was only a redshirt freshman last year, who I think was the newcomer of the year uh, in the conference. Explosive, slashing type of running back. He's small. He's like 185, a little thin-hipped. He's lean, but this guy is explosive. We'll take it up between the tackles, very patient, and then just darts through that line of scrimmage. The home run speed uh, in the second and third level can catch the ball really well out of the backfield, too. I don't expect him to declare in a year or two, but a guy just to keep your eyes on. But there's another quarterback that I think is worth talking about. And Fran, just tell me, who does this sound like I'm talking about? One year starter as a freshman, great touchdown interception ratio, very accurate, protects the ball, heavy run game, a lot of options, misdirections. I love his ball handling. We'll turn his back to the defense, quarterback runs, good pocket movement. Who does that sound like that just came out of last draft? It sounds a lot like Trey Lance. Who they, it uh, sure does. Offense. And that's, yeah. I'm talking about Grayson McCall at Coastal Carolina. He's 6'3", 200, not quite the 225 pounds that Trey Lance was. But just a similar type of aesthetics and situation that Trey Lance kind of came from. And we've only seen McCall play for one year, but it was in a really interesting offense. A lot more shotgun run stuff, a lot more true option and quarterback options and things like that, as opposed to North Dakota State was more under center and QB power and things like that. But just a lot of the same kind of situations. And mm. he had a really good season last year. They won 11 and one. I think they only got upset in their bowl game against Liberty, if I'm not mistaken. But Grayson McCall, he's only going to be a redshirt sophomore, but a guy to definitely file away for later. Interesting. I'm going to go back to the running back spot. And I want to talk about a guy who was one of the top running backs in the country last year. That's Kyron Williams from Notre Dame. Again, they played in the ACC last year, back to being independent status uh, here in 2021. Smaller back. He's 5'9", 195, and he, but he's got a satellite skill set. I'm going to get to that. He's a good athlete. He's got stop-start quickness. He's got burst to get through the hole. He can get to the perimeter, long speed to pull away. I, I, if you watch that uh, that uh, big game against Clemson in last November, uh, he had that long touchdown early in the game uh, that gave the, the Irish that early lead. Pass game skill set? On point. Uh, this guy, I mentioned the satellite skill set. He can move around. They ran, they had him run routes as a wide receiver. It wasn't just jailbreak screens and quick screens uh, from the slot. He would run, you know, crossing routes and digs and slants. Uh, but then also in pass pro, guys, at 5'9, 195, you would think, oh, you know, maybe this guy is awesome in pass pro. And it's willingness, it's technique. It's strength on contact, and then it's also his eyes. He tracks blitzers really well. He's always in the right spot. Really, really good pass protector, uh, Kyron Williams, just as a redshirt freshman last year. Um, as a runner, I would say solid skill set as a runner. The vision and patience are fine. He's got some shake at the second level in the open field, just not quite enough to always make that first man miss. It's a, He's not that kind of a runner, um, uh, but he's got, the, obviously, the athleticism is there, He's and he's also, he's not a power runner at, at that size. He's not a guy that's going to consistently move the pile. He runs hard. He just gets stuck on that first contact. He gets wrapped up a little bit too easily, and he put the, gr the ball on the ground a few too many times last year. He fumbled four times uh, in 2020. So uh, some things to work on in the run game. Satellite skill set certainly to work with in the pass game. I love the third down value. Was really, really productive last year as a freshman. Excited to see him here in 2020. New look offensive line uh, for to be cert certain. But uh, Kyron Williams, a really fun player. I'm not sure if either of you guys uh, have done a deep dive on him yet. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Kyron Williams, man. You talk about Jalen Rose's comment of irrational confidence. You know, you watch him, you're like, bro, that's a 6'4", 285-pound defensive lineman. Like, you can't truck him. Like, <laughs> But you love the confidence yep. there to, to want to do it. Um, and the fall, the, the, the ball issues uh, is, is where I have concern. Right. Um, that is something you have to clean up. But the fact that he's able to, to stick his nose in there and stonewall blitzers, um, to me, that screams he's a, a three-down back. Mm -hmm. So you want to see him continue to work on balance. There are times where, you know, that one arm swipe can trip him up and he'll fall down. Otherwise, it'd be a chunk play. Uh, but So you want to see him get better balance. So I think he can still thicken out. But I love the acceleration, the the arrogance he has of a Ricky Waters and how he runs. Just confident that I'm, I'm better than you running the football. Um, so I just love a lot about his game, and I'm excited to see him grow. And he was the engine for that offense uh, last year, for sure. 
All right, we're going to take a quick break so I can tell you more about Eagles Youth Football Clinics. And if you're local to the Philadelphia area, you have to know that they are back and in person on July 24th, open to boys and girls ages 6 to 14. This non-contact football clinic is a great opportunity for young athletes to learn from Eagles legends and improve their football skills with the Eagles of Football Academy coaches. Athletes will be grouped by age and taught football skills and fundamentals. Participants receive an Eagles Academy t-shirt and an Eagles player pack. Register today at eaglesacademies.com. Let's go to the other side of the football. Let's go top senior on defense. Uh, Emery, come back to you. It's been a lot of time in Cincinnati, right? Majai Sanders uh, from Cincinnati. You talk about someone, he's 6'5", 258, but you yeah. think he's, you know, 6'5", 220. He's, he carries mm-hmm. that weight well. So he's a, a rock at the point of attack. People think, oh, this is a slim dude. I'm about to bully him off the spot. And no, he's holding his own at the point. He's using his hands to disengage, using that length to be disruptive and chase down the run going away. And he's also having a good closing speed to the quarterback. So it's rare to see a senior uh, prospect, you know, at, at that position play as good as he, he has. Because usually guys that are playing well, they leave early. You know, so you see him there as a senior. So I'm impressed with the skill set. I, I like his game. I think he's going to be one of these plug and play type of players to go from college to pro and, and get off to a great start. Really good athlete. I mean, at times the rush well. He you know, he gets the edge on you. Uh, you know, he's got that ability to win high side. Uh, graduated from Camden County High School down in Jacksonville, but before that, he spent his previous three years at Reigns High School. And if you're an Eagles fan, you should be familiar with Reigns High School. That's Brian Dawkins, Harold Carmichael, Lido Shepard, uh, some Eagles greats uh, coming down uh, out of Reigns High School uh, down there in Jacksonville. Uh, you know, Brian, was- another, th- another thing with him, he bats down tons of passes. He too. does. Yep. I don't think passes batted down at the line of scrimmage are valued nearly enough. That's just mm-hmm. as good as an uh, you know a PBU in the second secondary or getting your hands on the quarterback just to have that awareness that if your rush dies out time the passing lane get your hands up and that's just as effective in getting your defense off the field he's that is the worst type of thing to happen at uh that's one of the more derailing things and demoralized demoralized things for an offense Mm -hmm. it's so bad you even see it at practice with you know coach like (laughs) man let him throw let him complete the pass (laughs) no one likes bad at passes so yes that is a valuable asset one of the most annoying things a defensive player could do ben let's come back to you we'll stay in the front seven uh who, who do you got here for this category Well, I think I got a guy that's built for NFL sub package defense. And every year we talk about safety prospects converting to linebacker. Well, let's get ahead on this because this guy's already converted. And that's Troy Brown at Central Michigan, who came into campus as a safety, but has been playing linebacker for the last three years at Central Michigan at 6'2", 205. He's certainly undersized, but this kid is tough. He's physical. He's explosive. He's a coverage linebacker. He shows that with his four interceptions, good matchups on running backs out of the backfield or athletic move tight ends. He's a blitzer. He can slash into backfields. He's got the explosive lateral range and the pursuit. He could turn and run over 300 special team snaps. First team all Mac the last two seasons. I just think this guy is built perfectly for today's sub package NFL, a little undersized at 205. I'd like to see him to maybe get to 210, 215, as long as it doesn't sacrifice the athleticism. But we talk about like the Dion Buchanan's of the world, strong safety at Washington State. He goes to the NFL, eventually converts to linebacker. I feel like Troy Brown is two, three years ahead on that trajectory and that development and mm-hmm. that he's already been playing in the box. He's already been playing Will Linebacker. He looks comfortable doing it. He looks tough enough to do it. We'll see if he could survive another season at 205, 210. I think he'll probably have to bulk up at the next level. But a guy that's really, really interesting and I think is just suited for today's NFL. Yeah, I'll go with another undersized defender in Jordan Strong. He's a corner from Coastal Carolina. It was a JUCO transfer a year ago, so only a one-year starter there for the Chanticleers. 5'11", 175-pound corner, okay? But this kid's a good athlete. He's got really clean feet, no wasted steps, really fluid hips to turn and run, and he's got that burst to close late. And, and that's whether he's closing late if he's trying to get back in phase downfield on a vertical throw – or, and this is this is the thing that's harder to find, in my opinion, is when he's got to put his foot in the ground and, and retrace his steps on a comeback route or on a deep curl route. He's in phase with the receiver who puts on the uh, you know puts on the brakes and goes back to the line of scrimmage. He's got that ability to put his foot in the ground and close, and, and that is tough to find. So I, I really like that 
from Jordan Strong. Not a burner, but solid speed. Never looked out of place there. And his, his lack of size and his lack of strength, that will show up at times. I don't think he's going to be that first guy off the bus, as we like to talk about it during the fall every week, Ben. He's not going to be that guy that's going to wow you in person. But I love him in off coverage. He reads the quarterback really, really well. Can jump plays. You think back to like an Asante Samuel, like that kind of corner uh, playing from depth. And I love his competitiveness. His play personalities are really, really impressive. Uh, he plays with a swagger. He plays with a level of juice that even the guys on defense, you go back and read articles um, back from early last fall as they started to get on their run. A lot of players and a lot of observers really kind of pointed to Jordan Strong on that side of the ball as bringing that level of juice. He's not bashful at all about coming downhill. The player that he reminded me of watching him was Jimmy Moreland, who was a really productive player at James Madison, undersized corner, kind of made that move uh, to the inside. I kind of see Jordan Strong as a a similar type of prospect. Um, I really liked his film. I had a lot of fun uh, studying him. Emery, we'll come back to you. Have you seen uh, Jordan Strong uh, or Troy Brown at all during uh, your your studies here this offseason? Yeah, I've seen both. Uh, Brown, I I like his eyes. And that's something that, you know, when you're making those transition – uh, from safety to linebacker, you worry about guys having safety eyes at linebacker when you need linebacker eyes. And I think getting that early start allows him to have linebacker eyes with safety athleticism. So Ben is right. He's on the right track. And Strong, obviously, I've seen a lot of because he's, mm. you know, he's in the Sun Belt Conference. And I know Louisiana tries to test those small corners with those big country strong receivers they have on the outside, guys that can run, but also guys that are that are towering him at six, two and a half, six, three. And the the fact that he was holding his own, you know, he was one of those nuisance type corners that can frustrate a taller receiver because he's constantly, you know, swiping at him, constantly, you know, being physical with them, despite giving up, you know, four inches and about 20 to 25 pounds. So let's go. Most intriguing underclassman on defense. Uh, I'll go first here with this one because this is a player that I think is very similar uh, to Troy Brown that Ben talked about from Central Michigan. And that's Tulane linebacker Dorian Williams, who was second team all AAC this past season, 6'1, 220 pounds. He actually stood out to me while I was watching Patrick Johnson, uh, the Eagles' seventh-round choice uh, this past year. He looks like a safety-playing linebacker, 6'1", 220, just a true junior here this year. So last year as a sophomore, he lined up both at weak side linebacker, so a stacked player, but then also as an overhang defender, so playing out in the slot. And depending on the game, depending on the package, he did one or the other uh, more often than not. But I think when you look at him, look, a really fluid athlete, Lateral movement, short area burst, you know, linear or lateral. He's got the ability to cover a lot of ground, really impressive movement skills, play strength, a little bit of a concern, struggles at time getting off blocks, but he's a forceful tackler. He sees what he hits. He brings his feet, runs through contact. Uh, really like him coming downhill. Um, solid instincts as a stack defender. He's not a guy that's lost uh, playing in traffic. He showed the ability to read the play, react, shoot the gap, uh, made plays on the opposite side of the line of scrimmage. Really productive last year in his only year as, a, as an impact player, as a role player uh, on defense. End of the day, I want to see him take another step because he only started four games this past year, and was good, but he still made second team all conference because of the impact he had when he was on the field. Uh, but as of now, I see a guy who I think is going to stick in the league as a, at the very least, you're looking at a package player on defense and a quality special teams player two seasons. So far guys, the guys played 432 special team snaps. He was a core four guy a year ago. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to have that guy. That's all easy day three pick high level athlete going to be a core player for you on special teams. That's the floor for Dorian Williams. What I want to see here in this officer or this season is can he take that next step to get into that day two conversation uh, as a guy that can stick at the linebacker spot. So uh, that's two lane linebacker Dorian Williams. Ben, I'll come to you uh, for uh, your next one. We'll stay in the front seven. We're going to go with a uh, defensive tackle, defensive end Cam Thomas at San Diego State. He's about 6'5", almost 270 pounds. And I don't say this slightly, guys. His 2019 season as a redshirt freshman was one of the best redshirt freshman seasons I've ever seen from a defensive lineman. Absolutely outstanding. Was an All-American, first-team All-Conference. This guy's athletic. He's long. He's versatile. And he plays up and down the defensive line. We'll even line up in nose tackle and some sub packages. But he's got an explosive first step. He plays off contact very well. Listen, his 2020 wasn't as dominant as that prolific 2019 season, but was still a really good player. And he's just a good overall defensive lineman with his versatility, his length, his strength. He's a good run defender, can play all over the line. His brother is actually the right tackle, so he's got a good football family as well. 
I swear there's flashes where you're going to think he looks like a JJ Watt type of prospect. Mm. Now, I don't know if it's just those long arms hanging off him. Um, maybe he's more of a Carl Nassib, Sam Hubbard type as well. But this is a guy that's really, really interesting. And he's kind of a bull in the China shop type of player in there. I like his 2019 tape a little bit more. I want to see how he kind of handles the uh, the transition year from the COVID year and whatnot. It's mm-hmm. also switched from that ugly number 65 to 99. So maybe that's what did it. But anyways, he's a really fun player over there at San Diego State. I like it. I have not done uh, Cam Thomas, and I have not done Emory's pick here for this category. Uh, Louisiana corner, Makai Garner. Long corner, 6'2", and has good press skills, man. He's underrated. And I think – more so people will see a lot of, of him in their opener against Texas because they're going to try to test him, but they won't have much success throwing his way. He's outstanding. He's going to be the next, you know, strong corner coming out of that Raging Cajun program because of how long he is, how athletic he is, and how solid he is in all facets of cornerback play. They Again, this may be the best Cajuns defense in about a decade. You know, uh, Treyon is is, a, is another one of uh, – Treyon is one of, one of the safeties – as a junior, but you look at Garner on at the corner, man. Corner, he's a big corner and can match up against anyone. And I think he's gonna. Everyone will get to know his name in Week One against Texas. You had to get one of your Cajuns in there. I mean, that was always. Uh, right? You always. know that that had to happen uh, before the end of this podcast. Uh, let's get to the next one, guys. Let's go biggest sleeper, and this is someone who we think is just flying under the radar as we enter the season. And, I, and I'll go first here. It's tough for a quarterback uh, to go under the radar, and I do think that all eyes are going to be on Nevada quarterback Carson Strong. Uh, He's gotten a little bit of buzz here this offseason. Ben, you mentioned him earlier. You alluded to him when you talked about uh, Romeo Dubs. I just think from a national standpoint, I think that there's obviously a lot of talk about Malik Willis. There's a lot of talk about Desmond Ritter. Uh, You talk about Grayson McCall after the year that he had uh, last year down in Coastal Carolina. I don't know that Strong is getting that same level of buzz from these non-power five quarterbacks. Um, and I think that he kind of belongs in that discussion. He's six foot four, 215 pounds. First of all, I love the scheme. It's a, a hybrid air raid, or air raid scheme because you've got Jay Norvell, who you know he's going to present uh, some of those under center but still spread looks, and they're going to try and spread you out and attack with everybody. But then also Matt Mummy, who's Hal Mummy's son. Hal Mummy is the, the godfather of the air raid along with uh, Mike Leach. Matt Mummy is running. He's got the air raid going. So Really, it's kind of fun to watch all the different variety of things that they're doing offensively. I, when you watch Strong, I don't think he's a guy that's going to be super toolsy. He's not a guy that's going to wow you off the cuff. Um, I, solid size, modest athleticism. Uh, you know, The arm talent is fine. It's not special in any sense of the word. So he's more of a touch thrower than a power thrower but he still made some tough throws at all three levels of the field. He's got a great deep ball. He throws with great touch to all three levels of the field, consistent accuracy as well. Whenever he, wherever he puts it, wherever he wants to. uh, And the accuracy is really, really good. He throws with anticipation. So he can make some of those tight window throws because he gets the ball out fast, really good sense of timing and rhythm. He can get from one to two to three to four pretty well. He can get through a lot of pure progression reading in that offense. And he does that. Well, rarely put the ball in harm's way. The interception that he had last year, a lot of them I wouldn't necessarily uh, put on him. There was some confusion um, from, from a receiver standpoint a number of times. That being said, from a decision-making standpoint, while he didn't throw a lot of picks and didn't have a lot of plays that you would say, oh, you know, th- that could have been picked off, there were too many times where he took so many bad sacks. I'd like to see him cut down on some of those where he played a little bit too much hero ball, trying to wait for receivers to open up, and he took some hits. He's not an escape artist. He's not that Houdini player. He can make that first man miss. He's just not a dynamic athlete. So he's got to be a little bit better in terms of getting the ball out fast. Uh, but the accuracy is, is there. I thought he handled pressure pretty well overall, whether that meant making a, a throw with a defender bearing down navigating in the pocket in terms of stepping up and, and finding a crease. He can do all that. I just want to see him get a little bit more consistent in that area of the game because when you're not the high-level arm talent, when you're not the dynamic athlete, you've got to be able to win in the mental game. And I think that he's on his way to doing it. I'm just excited to see him take the next step. But I really liked Carson Strong. Emery, I'm not sure if uh, if you had done any work on him. No, I, you know, again, I watched a lot of Nevada last year and, and watching that offense. That's why I like um, you know these Mountain West prospects, even going back to Cam Thomas. When you watch the Mountain West players, you're going to get a little bit of everything. Yeah. You know, you're going to see some option with New Mexico. You're going to see, you know, the spread attack with Nevada. You're going to see some power run game with San Diego State. So you get a good mix of everything. Mm. Um, and, and so you saw him last year really have to fight through adversity, coming back from, from uh, you know, down big and, and bringing the team back and winning game, winning that game against San Diego State uh, in, in a tightly contested match. 
you saw him bounce back from losing that game against San Jose State, who also is a really good team in the Mountain West, to you know come back and have a really good rest of the season. So, you know, yeah, you, you like to see those ebbs and flows of a season uh, with these quarterback prospects. So I do like uh, what he brings to the table. Now, a redshirt sophomore last year who was a team captain in 2020 and also, I met, failed to mention, had some pre-snap uh, ability as well. He, they, they asked him to do so, a decent amount pre-snap, um, and you can kind of see that on film. So another exciting thing, another feather in his cap. Uh, ben, I know you want to stay with the Wolfpack. So any thoughts there to close out Carson Strong, and then you can go uh, to his teammate there along the offensive line? Well, I wish I had some thoughts. You know, I tried to watch Carson Strong, and three plays in, I just saw this right tackle mauling people, and I said, <laughs> you know what? I'll go back to the quarterback. Let me watch this kid. And I discovered Aaron Frost, right tackle at Nevada. This guy is a mauling, heavy-handed SOB tackle that is as fun to watch as any prospect in this class. I promise. This kid is very, very physical. Uh, he's very active hands. He's going to jolt, displace, knock people off their feet at the point of attack. He's a lot of fun to watch. Now, listen, sometimes he's a little too aggressive. He lunges a bit. Uh, sometimes he'll miss at the point of attack. He's a little clunky and average in space. But if you want a guy that has great grip, torque, finish type ability, he's that guy. And he loves to finish defenders. I don't know if they're uh, giving gold stars for pancakes in that offense, but he loves to try to drop his weight on defenders right at the end of the whistle there. Needs to improve some technique stuff, sustaining blocks, things like that. But I've gone back and forth with their offensive line coach, Bill Best, who uh, com complimented me for discovering him and said, this guy is an absolute mauler. He's a butt kicker out there. He's very, very chippy on the practice field. He thinks his trajectory as a draft prospect is just starting. So that's what you get here on this podcast we're just kind of planting that seed and hopefully it grows during the season but right tackle Aaron Frost tight end Cole Turner at the Nevada offense we already talked Romeo Dubs going to be a lot of eyeballs on that Wolfpack offense this year it's a lot of that's the high hop offense out there you watch that offensive line they're just uh, pancakes left and right uh, getting guys <laughs> on the ground Emery uh, you're going to talk about some guys that got some buzz this spring and I'm so glad that these are the names uh, that you're bringing up from Sam Houston State yeah, because people during the fall when we looked like we weren't going to have a college football season was saying, oh, let's play in the spring. Uh, we'll watch it. College football is king. And then the spring came, you know, people were too busy ranking, you know, which uh, uh, superhero is better than this superhero. <laughs> they fake like they like soccer. But all the while, you know, <laughs> FCS was playing in the spring. And Jaquez Ezard of Sam Houston was just outstanding. I called a lot of his games when he was at Howard. There was one game in particular. I want to say it was against South Carolina State where he had a Randy Moss Thanksgiving type day. It was three catches, three touchdowns. I also feel as though he finished the day with like 300 plus yards receiving. Mm -hmm. And then he doubles up against the fam against FAMU, who I called, and was just outstanding. Like the first play of the game, first pass play of the game, Kelly Newton threw a bomb as it caught it and just like waltzed into the end zone. You see him transfer to Sam Houston pick up right where he left off, and you not only talk about someone that has the athletic ability, despite being 5'9", 195, but the sense of timing for when the big play needs to be made. And we saw that in that championship game against South, uh, South Dakota State. One, that mythical block in the back they call. It was like Rocket Ishmael. They call that mythical block in the back uh, when he broke the touchdown. Um, they called it back. Then I want to say like a couple plays later, he ends up scoring the touchdown anyway. You know, so this dude is big time in box office. I'm excited to see which all-star game gets his services. And his teammate, Zion McCollum, just shut down a lot of top wide receivers all throughout the spring. Christian Watson, who we're going to talk about, you know, down the line as a wide receiver for North Dakota State. That's an excellent option. Speed guy with, with height that can get down the field. Held him to like two catches and for under 30-something yards. Couldn't really buy a reception against him. And McCollum is 6'2", 200 pounds, length, athleticism, and good ball skills to make plays on the ball. So these are two premier prospects coming from the FCS and coming from one program, the national champion, Sam Houston Bearcats. For a real quick follow-up on Azard, is his game more like quickness, like a Kadarius Tony, or is it top-end speed? Is it, is it both? Uh, what, what element is he most bringing to an offense? It's both. He's yeah. a he's a catch-and-run guy. He's elusive. He's compact, but he's strong. You see him go up there um, – I think DJ Moore in terms of how physical he is when he's going up to make a play, right? So people think, oh, he's five now. He's not going to get up there. In that championship game, you saw them test him downfield 
in crucial situations one-on-one. He's going up and out-muscling the football from taller corners. And so that's the type of player you want. When the game needs a play to be made, this dude is making the play. All right, let's get to uh, a couple couple more categories here. We're going to get you out. Most to prove here. Someone with something to prove. Maybe it's a a guy coming off injury, scheme change, a down year last year, whatever it is. I'm going to go with uh, SMU wide receiver Reggie Roberson. Ben, you alluded to him earlier. Six foot, 200 pounds. He will be a fifth-year senior in 2021, one of those guys that took advantage of that extra year of eligibility. Three-year starter for Sonny Dykes in the air raid offense. He lines up to the far left of the formation, so only one spot, very limited route tree, and the routes he does run, you know, the routes aren't always great. That being said, he's got speed to burn. He can take the top off. They'll try and get him the ball fast. He can create yards after catch, and he can get over the top, and he tracks the deep ball extremely well. He's got really strong hands, kind of similar in a lot of ways to De'Ami Brown. Like, I mean, you go down the list, the, the, they check a lot of the same boxes, both in the pros and cons columns. I think when you look at De'Ami Brown, he ended up being a, a, a mid-day two, day two selection. I think Roberson, if he can stay healthy, and that's the big bugaboo. That's where I want you want to see if he can do that this year because he missed the last, last five games of 2019 due to a foot injury and then missed the last half of last year with a knee injury. So this is a guy that's spent the last two seasons uh, not finishing the year due to injury. Can he stay healthy here in his super senior season of 2021? He's got the ability to be a legit downfield threat in the NFL if he can stay healthy. Uh, that's my, my two cents there on Reggie Roberson, a really intriguing talent. Ben, I'll come to you for uh, for your pick here for most approved. Yeah, and he's going to have to get a new rapport with his quarterback this year. Yep. Tanner Mordecai coming over from Oklahoma, I believe, yes. as uh, Shane Bouchelle moved on. But I'm going to go with a Northern Iowa offensive tackle, not Spencer Brown, who headed to the NFL, who was at right tackle, but their left tackle. Trevor Penning at 6'7", 321, who I'm just absolutely gushing over. So why is he my most approved, friend? Because I need to see him against some better competition. Mm. And I'm circling that season opener at Iowa State. And they have a pretty athletic edge rusher, Will McDonald the fourth, who's explosive, who's long, who has an NFL type of pedigree. I just want to see Trevor Penning against, you know, a power five caliber of player because these FCS ends and defensive tackles, he is crushing in the run game. And you want to talk about about a IHOP offense? That's Northern Iowa. These guys love to pancake people, love to finish defenders into the ground. This guy fires off the ball. He grips, he torques, he finishes off, and uh, he loves to latch on contact. He runs his feet. He struggles a little bit redirecting. He's a little tight hip, so I want to see him against some twitchier athletes off the edge there, and I'm circling that Iowa State game, the season opener for both of them. So most approved, left tackle Trevor Penning, Northern Iowa. All right, we'll stay in the trenches. Emery, we'll come to you around this category out. Yeah, I'm going with Big Cat Bryant. You know, this dude was an all SEC player at Auburn and transferred to UCF. You know, it I, I just want to know why. Yeah, you know, I just want to see why. Yeah, you know, normally we see it the other way. Guys transferring up to an SEC to, to prove to, to scouts and evaluators what their skill set really is. But I want to know why he was able to trans or why did he transfer down? But all right, now that you did, you better end up with 20 plus sacks this season. You better dominate. Uh, at you know UCF, and to be honest, they need defensive help because we always mm-hmm. talk about their offense, but they can't stop anybody. And if he's going to be disruptive, this is the place to to really make a name for yourself in being disruptive. We know about their secondary, but Big Cat Bryant transferring from Auburn, where he was an All SEC performer, and if he doesn't make All American at UCF, I'm going to be highly upset. Now, right, something so. tells me he followed Gus Malzahn down there to UCF, who probably <laughs> recruited him to Auburn, who's now the head coach of UCF. That's a good point. Uh, and, I, and he also, didn't he like initially say he was going to transfer to Tennessee and then right, yep. backed out of that and went down to UCF? Uh, so I think that's certainly uh, what all American. That's right. All right. Well, <laughs> you're, you're laying down. You're laying down the gauntlet there uh, for Big Cat. And I think that he would fit this next category for certain. And that's a newcomer on the scene, either a transfer or a replacement player stepping in for a guy who has moved on to the NFL or has graduated. So, Emory, I'll come back to you on this one. Uh, another defensive end I know you want to hit on as well. Yeah, I'm going back to Louisiana with Chauncey Manek. He's like the Cam Johnson who plays for the Suns of this defense. Last year, you watched Louisiana. Every time Manak is in a game, he's making a TFL or a really good stop at the line of scrimmage or pressuring the quarterback and blowing up the quarterback on a pass play. And you're like, why is this dude not starting? Every time I watch him, he's making plays. Same with Cam Johnson. He's making all these shots, but he's not the starter. So I think now as a full-time starter on a defense that returns 11 starters uh, or 10 starters, 
um, that's the guy that's going to have a breakout season that people will become more familiar with as the season goes on. Again, best defense in about a decade. Chauncey Manak has a chance to really be a good power rusher. He has good instincts and make plays on both ends of defense. I'm going to go uh, back out to the Mountain West, and I want to talk about the Utah State linebacker Justin Rice, who has just had a ridiculous journey uh, to join the Aggies here at Utah State. Two-star running back recruit out of the Bay Area, out in California. Goes to Fresno State as like a running back, fullback hybrid in 2016. Makes the move to linebacker as a sophomore in 2017. Plays special teams. Then he takes a planned red shirt in 2018. He plays four games. They had a couple senior linebackers who went into the draft that year. So look, we're going to red shirt you this year, get you ready. Then you're going to have two years to really break out and prove your, improve your wares uh, to the NFL. That plan worked great. 2019, first team All-Mountain West Conference stuffed the stat sheet. Over 100 tackles, seven TFLs, three sacks, four forced fumbles, two picks. So blew up the stat sheet as a, as a redshirt junior in 19. Then COVID hits, no Mountain West football in 2020. That's what, at least what they announced in the summer. So they opened up the transfer portal. He said he ends up at Arkansas State because they're going to play football. He wants to play that final year. He ends up going down there, and his first team all Sun Belt stuffs the stat sheet once again. Transfer, transition now. The NCAA gives those guys an extra year of eligibility. He says, yeah, sure, I'll take it. Utah State hires Arkansas State's head coach. So now Rice, who still has that free year, he leaves Utah State, or he leaves Arkansas State, follows his head coach over to Utah State, uh, and now he will ch- has a chance to be, and I can't imagine this has ever happened before, guys. He will be, uh, has a chance to be a three-time first-team all-conference player for three straight years for three different teams at the FBS level. Like I can't imagine that has ever been done uh, at any position in college football. He's 6'2", 230, big kid. He can shock offensive linemen on contact. Needs to get make better decisions with defeating blocks. Sometimes he'll like to go back door. Uh, good zone coverage defender. He's a limited athlete. I think it's going to kind of cap his ceiling. He's a good blitzer. He led the team in sacks uh, last year as well. Uh, but just a crazy story there for Justin Rice, the linebacker from Utah State. Uh, ben, round us out here with, uh, with your newcomer. Just trying to catch up on that. He's got like a Dude, career that, that, movement already. He hasn't ridiculous. left college. Three schools, <laughs> position changes, not to mention his brother played tight end with him at yep. Fresno or one of now those stops somewhere. Yeah. But anyways, uh, we I'd be remiss to not mention a quarterback transfer. Apparently yep. that, that happens from that time matters, to time yeah. these days. But we're going to go with Jack Cohn going to Notre Dame, replacing the legend of Ian Book down there, who is, uh, I believe, the all-time winningest quarterback yep. at Notre Dame. But Jack Cohn's coming over from Wisconsin after not playing in 2020. The last time we saw him battled Justin Herbert in the Rose Bowl and took a lead in a halftime against Ohio State and Justin Fields in that Big Ten championship mm. game in 2019. He's a good-looking kid. He's about 6'4", 220, strong arm, uh, you know, will hang in the pocket. He's got enough looseness and mobility to kind of escape some pressure, but not a dual-threat quarterback by any means. But he's got a real veteran receiving core uh, out there at Notre Dame. He's got a senior center. He's got Kane Madden coming over from Marshall, who is another nice transfer. I think Jack Cohn is in a great situation at Notre Dame to really show what he can do at the next level. And I think he's kind of in that middling group of quarterbacks trying to figure out, are you a six seventh or are you maybe a two or three mm-hmm. with some other guys like Phil Jurovic at Boston college, or maybe a Kenny Pickett at Pitt, just kind of dwindling in the middle of the draft right now. But mm-hmm. I think Jack Cohn has a great opportunity at Notre Dame this season. Well, let's transition now to our final category. We'll be fast with this one. Our future stud. This is a guy that's not draft eligible for 2022, but we need to watch for the future. And Ben, I'll come to you because uh, Jack Cohn will be potentially throwing passes uh, to a guy that a lot of people are really high on, and that's the Irish tight end, Michael Mayer. All right. I know every year there's somebody that gets deemed Don't the do baby it. Don't Bronco, say, no, Bronco of the world. Don't say but it. But Michael Mayer may be <laughs> it. And I know you're thinking, well, I thought that was Cole Nett, you know, the previous tight end. I thought that was, you know, somebody before that. No, this Pat is Pat moved last year. Yeah, right. This is the one. He's 6'4", 250. He's a great route runner. Um, he's He'll block in line for you. He'll block down the field for you. But I was really most impressed with his hands and his ability to run routes as a true freshman last year. Was a pretty productive player with Jack Cohn coming over. He loves to hit those tight ends coming from that Wisconsin offense. I'm just excited to see Mayer as more of the feature tight end in this offense. Was in a bit of a stable last year with uh, Tommy Tremble and some other guys on that offense. So if this quarterback's willing to let it loose, which Michael Mayer got open more than his production showed last year. Ian Book, 
tendency to hold the ball, scramble around a little bit. Yep. If Jack Cohn's willing to let it loose, Michael Mayer is going to have huge production. But just remember, not eligible yet, just store it away for later. Uh, I'll, I'll go here with, with the uh, my all AAC pick because uh, I watch a lot of the all a, a lot of the AAC um, being a Temple guy. Raji Harris was a true freshman running back last year for the ECU Pirates, and absolutely, I mean, his first team all conference. He was the rookie of the year in the conference. Five foot ten, over two hundred twenty five pounds as a true freshman. Kind of reminds me of like a Kevin Smith when he was a UCF, really really productive player. Went to the Lions, had a few, had a, a few years uh, of productive football as a backup. Big track runner, better wiggle than expected for a guy his size. Solid vision, especially in the zone run game. You can see him kind of playing peekaboo with linebackers and safeties, attacking the line of scrimmage and create some big runs that way. I would just like to see more. Uh, involvement in the pass game, both as a blocker and as a pass catcher uh, here as a sophomore, but just a name to kind of file away for the future. Uh, Raji Harris, the running back from ECU. Uh, Emery, we started this off with you talking about Malik Willis. We're going to come to you, round us out here uh, with another quarterback. Yeah, Cornelius Brown, the fourth out of Georgia State. He's 6'5", about 205 pounds. He's lean, so he has a chance to thicken out his frame, but when you watch him, you love his confidence. You love his ability to work touchdown to check down the passing game. And it didn't matter what the opponent was, whether it was, you know, uh, Coastal or Louisiana. He had a lead against Louisiana, and they really needed help from Elijah Mitchell to go out there and run them back into the game because Brown was really dealing on third downs inside the red zone. He can scramble a little bit, kind of like Aaron Brooks. He's a tall guy with a whip for an arm. Mm. Excited to see him continue to grow. He was a freshman last year, so he's now a sophomore. So excited to see what he can continue to do because Georgia State is set up nice. I love their program and how they've been able to grow it into what it is. They're going to be really good for quite some time. And Cornelius Brown, the fourth, his nickname is Quad, which I love. I just think that's a, that's a cool, unique nickname. Uh, well, he better like be able to back that up. Like I want to assuming that's like, for uh, being yeah. the fourth in his family, not for having huge quads. Yeah, with yeah, a six five, right. six five, two hundred pound frame. Something tells me he doesn't have the uh, the bulk in the way. I don't know what he squats together. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, we uh, we had a, what is it, a pool of over a hundred schools. We ended up pulling uh, thirty of the the players that intrigued us most here uh, in the last hour or so. Emery, thanks so much for joining us, uh, especially last minute notice uh, here on the journey of the draft podcast. We will talk to you again soon as we get into the season. Make sure you're following Emery. I gave you all of his information earlier in the podcast. Emery, we will talk to you soon. Ben, we will talk to you next week. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Ben and with Emery. We covered a ton of players. Like I said, just about an hour long, we hit on 30 of the top prospects outside the power five. We're going to do it all again, coming up next week, myself, Ben Fennel, potentially Dane Brugler as well. We're going to go to the big 12. We're going to cover the top prospects from Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Texas, Texas Tech, big one here in Iowa State as well. So we're going to cover all the top prospects out in the Midwest, out in the Plains. We're going to do all that in the Big 12 preview. That's next week right here on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand. Hi, Eagles fans. I'm Connor Barwin, and I'm here to tell you about the Eagles Autism Challenge presented by Lincoln Financial Group. This year's event will take place on Saturday, August 21st, and we can't wait to see all of you back at Lincoln Financial Field live and in person. Register today to walk, run, or ride. In addition to making a transformational impact on the autism community, you'll also receive a complimentary ticket to our public practice on Sunday, August 22nd. Register today at eaglesautismchallenge.org, and I'll see you there.